Hey, welcome to The Question, a Blog Talk Radio conversation with me, Doug Padgett, your host, joined by a co-host each half an hour here on Tuesdays between 9.30 and noon, joined by the czar of Cocoon and SMS Builders, Steve Sherber. This is Steve. He has come. Hi. He has come wearing his, uh, his colors today. When are we going to see a Cocoon brand logo? Um, logo logo has been developed. Logo has been developed um, by yeah. Lulu. Actually, yes. Logos by Lulu. Logos by actually, it was a collaborative. Uh, Andy Campbell. Yes. And Lulu Petrina, as, as you some of you might know, another uh, another uh, guy named Philip Jonkis, um, and the three of those guys uh, put together a really great branding campaign, and uh-huh. we selected final branding. Who did the logo ago. work? Who was all the three logo? of them did collectively. They all did. Yeah. Because I, I, I need logos for a couple of things. One of them for you. We need a new Solomon's Porch logo. Interesting. Lulu yeah, might be I, the one, huh? Um, I I don't know Lulu, that ben. she 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 might be into that. I don't know if she does that like on the side normally. Matter of oh. fact, I don't think she normally does logos. She's just a very talented gal. Yes, yeah, just she good can at do stuff. pretty much anything. She's a genie. Yeah. Yeah. She's a magician. Yeah. She's a wizard. Yeah. What's a female wizard called? Is there one? What are they called? A witch? witch? No, is it? No. <laughs> a sorceress? I don't know what they're called. Well, this is Steve Sherber, and Steve Sherber and I talk on uh, Tuesdays from 11 to 11.30 about a number of things, and sometimes that includes how we live in our homes, how we design our homes, the perfect system, and, of course, in being in search of the perfect wall. And Steve owns SMS Builders, the finest in home remodeling for you in the Twin Cities and beyond. And also Cocoon, which is a, an effort to help people understand the systems and preferable changes to their dwellings. High performance living. High. Really? Mm-hmm. Come on, seriously, that's awesome. That's our tagline. High performance living. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Welcome to high performance living. That that sounds like a uh, a, a seven week sermon topic at a big big church. Uh, it is for your house instead of your soul, which is something other than yourself. It's your house. High performance living. And one could Fantastic. argue that your house is not different from you. Oh, nice. See, now we're going to get into a little a little quantum reality when it comes to understanding. Um, the places that we dwell and the people that we are. Mm-hmm. That your body is a temple, but it's also you. Then maybe the, the cup in your hand also is you. I Yeah. I mean, right now it's part of a system, right? It's interacting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, re-listening to a book called The uh, Short History of Nearly Everything. It's this Love great little book. book, and it's uh, a science-oriented book about how do we know what we know about science. Um, and when... When they're talking about, he's talking about Bill Bryson. Yeah, Bill Bryson. He's talking about molecules and DNA and what makes you up Mm -hmm. and how somehow they they know this or estimate this that the molecules that make you up are the same molecules that you know you you are some percentage of Genghis Khan, right? Like when his molecules recycled back into the cosmos, that some of those molecules made you up. And it's this very trippy sort of. Yeah, sort of idea, but it takes some period of time. Yeah. And he says, like, like you know, some of you will be disappointed to know that you are zero percent Elvis Presley, because <laughs> it takes a certain period of time. But um, for so, the, for those mo- molecules to get redistributed, to get redistributed. The so interesting. In some sense, you are, you know, you I, are. What I really liked about that book, one of the facts in there was that idea of all of history, all of time of existence that we're aware of. He says, if you compare it. To your, the span of your arms, you know, your arm length span, uh-huh. the, the, the amount of time out of that entire timeline that humans have been around uh-huh. is just a fingernail thickness on that entire length. Yeah. And it really reminds me of the whole, like, I don't know, no offense to anyone out there, but tree hugger sort of argument, <laughs> save the planet. <laughs> but when you read that to understand, like, how certain generations of, of life forms existed for, you know, Time spans that are yeah. a, a million times greater than we've been around. Yeah. And then we're completely wiped off the face of the planet. And then a new life form came in. Yes. That really it's not 
the planet that needs saving. It's the humans that need saving. Yeah, right. I, I guess what most people would, if you pushed them on that, they would say, save the planet so that it remains hospitable for the quality of life that we would all like and the things that we see, right? Like, right, right, right. like I guess, yeah, even if, even if you burned the whole thing out, there would still be a planet here in sort of the celestial realm, like, right? There'd be a planet orbiting the sun. Yeah. But you would like for it to be a place that you could have a nice vacation. Yeah. A cool summer day. But don't you think that's different than a meteorite coming and making it a very inhabitable place or non-inhabitable, uninhabitable uh-huh. place uh-huh. versus our quality of life diminishing and the earth just simply adjusting to its inhabitants behavior? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's saving the earth for human beings and animals. Yeah. That's what people are. That's what they're really getting at. Because you could smog the place out so that it's uninhabitable. You could drop a nuclear bomb on a place and spread radiation. So. And the Earth would still be there, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, and if you didn't recover. blow it up. And then something else would grow back. You know, and this obviously because the United States dropped nuclear weapons on, on uh, uh, Hiroshima um, and Nagasaki. So we do know, yes, people live there now. So, yeah, it does come back. But I think the point people are getting at is, well, if we could keep from screwing this place up, that would be great. Mm-hmm. So really it is a, a human-centric uh, approach to living on the earth that people want, which so, you know isn't such a bad thing, no, it's really. A great thing, but I mean, I, I would like that. I would the, like the earth to be hospitable to me. Uh, I agree, but the, the, everybody's missing. So, from the scientists' sort of argument, everybody's missing the key point. It's not use less carbon or save the water. It's quit having babies, right? <laughs> because truly, it's th- there's some st- study out there that was saying that at, at population our is an population's issue. Population's the issue. Yeah. And, like, our Earth can, our Earth, the Earth, planet Earth, can sustain, like, a billion people. That Like, that's sort of its break-even point. Yeah, I, I, I that hear that. Yeah, I've heard that, too, from people. And it all, yeah. If yeah. that's the case, we're which it, uh, Which battle. it obviously isn't, right? Yeah. Because we're, we're, we're seven times that. Well, yeah, and, and I, I mean, like, right now, if you look at some of the arguments in the science, we're on a decline. Like, things are going south, right? Yeah. Global yeah. warming. And, you know, resources are disappearing. Well, and you at, need your mic closer. At, sorry. At, at this, if at, you want to lean back, I can make that possible. At this rate, it we're going south. We're not on a sustainable path. We're on a we're on a consuming path. Yeah. But if you were to say, okay, where do we, where where do we, where do we have to draw the line to make that all of a sudden, you know, plateau and stabilize? Yeah. Would it be a million people? Would it be? Or billion? Would it be four billion? Would it be six billion or five billion? Yeah, and it really points out a question that that is worth asking, and that is, what do we mean by it's sustainable? Meaning, there's no effect of human beings on the planet, which is what the billion, like the billion people threshold number, is. You could spread a billion people around and make no definable change to the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's others who say, well, hang on a minute. We're part of the planet system. Mm-hmm. We can make changes to this thing. That's mm-hmm. not, you know, uh, hopefully we're not making them in determinations that are so destructive to other species that they can't exist. Mm-hmm. But the idea of like, no, you know, it's that, that faux little camping idea that no, you leave no, leave trace, no trace that you're ever here. I mean, that. It's doable. Hey. N- no detectable trace. Well, I mean, you're going you to leave electromagnetism. A, you're going to leave you bring in a, fermions. You know, you're going to leave atoms. If you bring There's, in the crime, the crime scene investigator unit. That's just because they don't know what to measure. But that's the whole point: is <laughs> what, <fermions>. what, <laughs> you know, what are you, <laughs> what, what are you choosing to measure? And, and so, if it is right. well, what we mean by leave no trace is don't break branches and don't leave, don't leave ashes, like, wrappers. And and yeah. Okay, Don't get poop the point. On the middle of the trail. Yeah, yeah, get the point. Um, but it, it draws a really interesting comparison to the, like the, the macro version, uh, you know, being the story of the planet, how we survive in it, 